I'm just so thrilled to see you all um, here today. Uh, and thank you so much for letting us know where you're sitting today as you, uh, as you join us. Um, it's, it's a really common practice now uh, for us to acknowledge country. Um, and I just wanna make sure we take a, a moment and, and do it justice. So um, when I think about evaluation, I, I often think about learning from those who've come before, um, building on the wisdom that exists. And so when I think about acknowledging the elders of the country that I am dialing in from, so the Bunurong country um, down in, uh, in St Kilda in Melbourne, um, it really gives me pause uh, and kind of this deep sense of wishing to, um, to really connect and honour the work that's come before and the people and the leaders that have come before, uh, the Aboriginal people who are here um, with us now um, from Australia uh, and from other, um, from other countries, uh, the other, other First Nations people, uh, and to think about how we kind of build on what we know so far about um, learning from those cultures. Um, one of the challenges that we continue to grapple with as evaluators is how do we do evaluation better in accordance with self-determination principles and practices. Um, it's an area I still feel entirely novice at, um, but sitting here and, and paying acknowledgement to the country I'm trying to do better. I think we as a profession are trying to do better um, and just really wishing to pay my acknowledgements and acknowledgements from uh, from the, the network um, of, of how fortunate we are to be able to building on uh, on the work and on the, the history of people who have come before. So um, just a little touch on uh, on housekeeping. Um, we are recording today. The recording will be available um, from the AES. Um, uh, when they get a moment to kind of clear, <laughs> get, a, get a clear moment. Uh, I'm sure it'll happen pretty, pretty quickly. Um, we uh, will be taking notes, uh, we'll be taking questions in the chat. Um, so if you have questions as we're going through, please feel free uh, to put them, uh, to put them in. Um, we, as always, um, really value your thoughtful contributions. So um, if there are questions that are beyond the scope of this conversation, please let us know what they are because it helps Christabel and I and other members of the steering committee think through um, how we might better take um, the network forward. Um, so the format for, for today is that I'm going to give you a brief update on the work of the Australian Public Sector Evaluation Network. Um, then we are um, really delighted to have uh, two colleagues with us from uh, from the ANU who've done a lot of uh, really fantastic work in this space to help throw some ideas for our consideration about evaluation uh, in the public sector. Uh, and then there'll be a facilitated conversation um, at the end. So I will, um, uh, let me, allow me to introduce um, my colleagues, so uh, Dr. Christabel Darcy is the Assistant Director for Program Evaluation in the Department of Treasury and Finance uh, for the Northern Territory. Um, Dr. Rob Bray, PSM, um, is here with us from the ANU. He's join he joined the ANU in 2010 after a long career in the Australian Public Service uh, and has been seminal um, in a, a number of really key and complex um, evaluations, which I'm sure he'll touch on uh, through his work. Um, Professor Matthew Gray is also here with us. He's Director of the ANU Centre for Social Research uh, and Methods um, and has previously held important positions such as the Director of the Centre for Aboriginal Economic Research, Policy Research, uh, Director of Research for the College of Arts and Social Sciences and Deputy, Deputy Director of the Australian Institute of Family 
study. So um, we've got some people with really deep lived experience within the public sector uh, and also who have spent a career um, doing really deep thinking about, about this really tricky topic of evaluation in the public sector. So in a moment, um, I'll hand over to Christabel um, to, uh, to introduce the sort of the meaty part of the session. But I did want to give a little moment um, on the Australian Public Sector Evaluation Network or APSEN as, as, we, um, as we're known. We uh, launched last year, last festival. So we're still pretty new. Uh, and what has been really fantastic to see is that there's such a huge appetite of um, enthusiastic, engaged, skilled people uh, in the public service and in the public purpose sector um, who are wanting to change the world through evaluation. Um, so we have nearly 500 members now in APSAN. Um, we aim to provide a dedicated informal network to connect people working in evaluation in the public sector to share information and build capability across the membership. Um, we have a tremendous steering committee. Christabel uh, is a, a key member. Uh, we have another eight um, steering committee colleagues. Um, we've been working really hard behind the scenes to, to try and push ourselves on how can we best turn that aim into something that is useful and practical and um, doable within the context of a pandemic. Um, and the thing that we're most proud of uh, is the um, SharePoint site. So Epson has its own SharePoint site. Um, it's available to all members and there's just a raft of really helpful tools and templates and artifacts um, that can help you as you're um, grappling through your evaluation uh, challenges. Um, so a plug, I'll put, I'll put a note in the chat later, but um, if you haven't already joined us, um, please do. We'd love to see you uh, as part of the membership. Um, you can email it at us at apsan at aes.asn. Um, dot au. I could talk about Epson all day, but I'm actually more interested to hear what uh, Christabel, Rob and Matt have to say. So I'm going to mute myself uh, and hand over to Dr. Christabel Darcy. Thanks, Joe. Um, and we just wanted to give a little bit of context before Rob uh, starts the presentation um, formally. Um, because as evaluators, we should be interested in the evidence base of our approaches, uh, including our evaluation systems. Um, and when Rob and Matt's uh, research was first published, um, it was just at the time that we in the Northern Territory were setting up our whole of government approach to evaluation. And we were moving from a very uh, decentralised evaluation approach to a coordinated central approach. And it was a major reform that involved changes to our budget development process and our cabinet submission templates. And we knew that simply writing a guidance document wasn't going to be enough. We also had to drive some cultural change uh, in the way that people perceived and approached evaluations. And we had to explain why, why we needed this change. Um, and this research, um, evaluation and learning from failure and success, makes a strong case for a centrally coordinated approach to evaluation, uh, in which the responsibility for evaluations continues to be with line agencies. And my understanding of the evidence is that this approach keeps the close link between evaluations and the program area, while avoiding the downsides of a decentralized approach. Now in the NT, we are hoping that our centralised approach will improve coordination of evaluation across government, uh, support a consistent standard of evaluation, help prioritise and identify gaps in evaluation and build a centralised repository of evaluations. And it was just so valuable to have an authoritative resource supported by thorough research and a superstar reference panel, which included people like Patricia Rogers, Tom Karma, and Nicholas Bruin. Now, I don't know if the way that we have integrated evaluation into our policy and budget development process has been a change for the better, 
but we will be evaluating the reform. And I can say that we will do our best to learn from the evaluation findings and add to the evidence base of how to improve evaluation functions in government. Um, as this research influenced the way that we established our whole of government evaluation approach in the Northern Territory, I'm so pleased that Rob and Matt have agreed to present these findings today as part of Festival, and I hope you find it as thought-provoking as I did. Over to you, Rob. Thanks. Uh, first of all, I'm talking from Ngunnawal country, and I acknowledge that we're a settler society that lives on lands which were forcibly taken from the Indigenous people of Australia. And I'd also, as, as an introduction, thank the AES for the invitation to talk today. I'll just get the slides up and hopefully get into it. Yes. I hope that's on everyone's screen now. The, I'll Perfect. talk today drawing on two papers. The first was one uh, which we prepared for the Australian New Zealand School of Government as an input to the Thodi review of the Australian Public Service. And that was done in association with another ANU researcher, Paul Tahart. And then the second journal article in the Australian uh, Pacific Journal of Public Administration, which we did with David Stanton, who once again brings a very long history of evaluation and public administration on it to it. Both Matthew and I are from the ANU. Uh, my background, as Chris Bill mentioned, was in the public service and I moved over to the ANU and Matt's had a similar sort of mix of experiences. And some of the major evaluations we've been involved in have been the evaluation of new income management in the Northern Territory and most recently the evaluation of childcare reforms which we hope will be out in public fairly soon. The focus, however, today will be on some of the materials coming from the ANZOC papers. As I mentioned, they were developed to feed into the Thodi review, and why not start off with the conclusions? Uh, the Thodi review recommended that uh, a culture of evaluation be embedded in the public service, specifically the departments of finance develop an APS wide approach to build evaluation capability and ensure systematic evaluation of programs and policies. That there be a central enabling function established in finance and that departments establish their own evaluation functions and publish annual plans, as all the evaluation should be published and this exempt by cabinet, and that cabinet establish a systematic approach to the formal evaluation of all programs and policies. The government agreed in part. Uh, it's spoken of establishing a small team within the Department of Finance. Uh, it's decided that publication should be where appropriate. Uh, and it rejected the systematic approach within the cabinet process of ensuring those evaluations were embedded. It also, though, did note the creation of a specialist evaluation profession within the public service. So moving to the paper before further, it was essentially written around six questions that we were asked by ANZOG, but at the same time, we include an initial discussion of what we really saw as, as the tensions that come out. And these are the four questions I'll deal with in more detail as I talk. Is what is accountability, the link with learning, the problem of the immediate, and that balance between centralization and decentralization. I'll also refer to big data, which was a topic which we picked up in the Asian Pacific paper. 
But before I get into the problems, it's most probably worthwhile looking at what's not a problem. The first one is that we echoed Shand with his finding that the major issues are evaluation and managerial rather than methodological. Essentially, our view is the public service has the capability and the skills to undertake and to manage evaluation. That's not to say that these can't be enhanced, but rather that the base skills are there. It's not... The second is that old debate upon whether or not evaluation should be done internally within the public service or externally through the use of consultants and others. We did not see that as a really big divide. There are merits in both approaches. Uh, external, it takes you outside the immediate. It allows for a different perspective to be brought to the problems. And it allows for multidisciplinary teams, large field work, and a lot of other things to be organized. And sometimes that's appropriate. Internal evaluation allows people to use a lot more of that detailed expertise and knowledge of programs on the ground. Uh, it allows that phenomenally important use of contacts within organizations to obtain information and to understand why things have been done. So it's really a balance. In terms of the public service and evaluation, we did though feel that there was a big need for the public service to think a little bit more about the management of evaluations. And a couple of points come up. Um, some of these are of course influenced by the fact that we're now working as external evaluators. The first is not to attempt to micromanage external evaluators. If, should I say, if you've taken the risk to go down that path, you keep with that risk and you allow the evaluators to work. Especially if it's long term evaluation running over a year or two, weekly reporting, etc., does not facilitate that process. The second is to avoid task fragmentation. Uh, at times now, the public service will get someone to do one bit of an evaluation, someone else do another bit, a third group to collect the data. It makes it very difficult to do a cohesive evaluation if you're relying upon the data that someone else has collected and the particular questions they pose, or if bits of the evaluation are done separately, you do not get that whole picture. Access to data is phenomenally important. And we've experienced a number of cases where while the evaluation people are committed, the rest of the organization is not committed. And so those individuals who are custodians of the data are not necessarily willing to provide that data. Only two more problems, timing, we get the surge of RFQs that come in in April, when everyone's realized they've got some money left in their budget. The bottom line is these evaluations are never delivered within the original time scale. Uh, so just think about that, please. And the final one is to think about how you manage ev external evaluators over a longer term. Did we do a good job? Who are the evaluators who you actually want to keep on using? Who are the evaluators you don't want to use? Do you share with your colleagues across the public service? Who was a successful evaluator and who not to touch? So often everyone seems to go back to square one and that sort of shared corporate knowledge doesn't seem to be used in the process. So there are those management issues that most probably should be looked at. Moving on to the question of accountability, the first of those big issues that I raised. And this comes very much to how we pitched what we recommended in that paper for the Fodi inquiry. 
we accept the Australian government does follow the Westminster principle. Uh, however, we note, and that's the traditional responsibility of departments to their ministers, ministers to parliament. Although we notice these days, the accountability tends to be much more ministers to cabinet or ministers to the prime minister and accountability decisions being taken on that basis, often in a politically expedient way, rather than full accountability to the parliament. So I'll come then to the evaluator, evaluator general approach, which for those who don't know, was a proposal particularly strongly backed by Nick Groom, but by a number of others, suggesting that an evaluator general as an equivalent to the Auditor General be established that would undertake and manage public sector evaluations and would report directly to the Cabinet. We looked at this proposal in quite some detail and it was really a big question of balance. And what we saw was lots of positives around the potential of this type of approach and negatives around the reality of it being actually able to be properly instituted in Australia at this time. Uh, the real problem is it requires very long term bipartisan political commitment. And we know, for example, and that includes the dollars. And as we know, sort of with the orders of general even, there are questions about whether or not there are sufficient resources being given to the orders of general to fully do the function. And that is an incredibly well-established institution within Australia's parliamentary democracy. So there are questions around whether a second one, a second mechanism would actually be able to garner that amount of support. The other issue is that within government, government departments manage their contact very strongly with the Orders of General. Uh, and that this was not really what we saw as the best environment for really good evaluation. So the departments have always tried to keep their distance from the Orders of General, manage what information flows. So that was the second problem was that we could see that being replicated. Coming to two other questions of accountability, of the scope of evaluations and objectives, and looking at those, traditionally, and this is a quote from Volcker, who talks of evaluation having three lines, One's efficiency, how well it's been implemented, effectiveness, and then appropriateness. Now, across the literature, this issue of appropriateness is quite contested. If you look at the UK, uh, I can never remember which colour which of their books is, uh, but the UK main evaluation book, uh, it's not mentioned at all. In the loss of the US material is not mentioned. Uh, but this third one is this one around objectives. Is it consistent with the needs of the client group and wider government policy considerations? Now, firstly, of course, these two objectives can really be seen as being often in conflict with each other. So the interests of, the, of a client group for a program is not necessarily the same as the government policy considerations. Uh, now, we took the approach and Thody had spoken in some of the earlier material about rising expectation of citizens for more transparency and accountability. And for that reason, we actually see this third objective as being a very important one in public sector evaluation, but it's one which does have to be managed quite cautiously by those who are undertaking the evaluation. The second is that we tend to evaluate against program objectives. And this, these next two slides talk about program objectives. 
New Start payment, that's unemployment uh, support for the unemployed, I think it's now Job Seeker. In 1997-98, in the DSS annual report, it gave a really clear objective. It was to ensure that unemployed people received adequate levels of income to support themselves. It then had a stack of indicators, including the adequacy, whether it's enabled financial independence, take up, because it was seen important, the program not only provide those benefits to those who applied for it, but also to those who were eligible for it and did not apply. That was obviously a program effective in this issue if people were not taking it up. The Minister of Efficiency, Customer Service and Protection of Human Rights. Now the same program 20 years later is described in the DSS PBS as being to assist people who are temporarily unable to support themselves and the performance criteria is that there's an agreement in place with the Department of Human Services that the payments are made in accordance with relevant legislation, policy and guidelines. That concept of adequacy is not mentioned there at all. And in fact, even further, uh, DSS was responsible for the whole of government submission to the 2019 Senate inquiry into the adequacy of New Start. And the word adequacy in that submission only appeared once, and that was in the title reference. So from the perspective of evaluators, uh, this question of evaluate against the objectives, what are the objectives? What are the real objectives? What are the unstated objectives so often of governments? in the policies. And if you're thinking about embedding long-term evaluation, what happens when the objectives are reframed to this degree? Second subject is accountability and learning. And this is a challenge for both organizations and for evaluators. So if one goes to sort of the classic statement of the functions of evaluation, and I'm quoting here Mark Baird, there's accountability, making sure that public institutions and their staff are held accountable for their performance, as well as allocation and then learning. The problem is, is if we use evaluation in this accountability sense as a matter of judgment, of the performance of people, how do we actually always build in learning and how can we build good learning organisations? Now, these points here, there are six of them which come out of work in particular of Paul to Hart. One important one, most probably in terms of the network, is the third, look widely and compare performance. So the building a learning organization is not just thinking about your own performance, your own experience, but what are the parallel experiences? What's the international experience? And look at all of that and draw upon that to help build your organizational focus. Sitting above all of these, I see really two quite strong important issues. The first is corporate memory. Building a corporate memory is absolutely essential to having a learning organization. Because if you come to the last bit, your lesson drawing from what's happened in the past, you're sustaining it, which means you actually have to look both backwards and forwards. Looking widely also involves looking at your past history. So corporate memory is very important and how you can preserve corporate memory through reports, evaluation reports, etc. cetera. Uh, the second is building organizations where it's safe to be self-critical. I've got no simple answers on how one does that, but to otherwise recognize that as a challenge. The next focus is that problem of the immediate. 
with governments increasingly focusing on the short term. We all know the 24 hour news cycle and that really poses a big problem. And especially since it's a new cycle, it's into gotcha and comes back to that question about accountability and learning. Unfortunately, also within the public service, it means we really do reward the fixers. Those who can play with that 24 hour cycle, who can come up with the instant answers, not those who are necessarily looking at the long term. Uh, the problem is evaluation takes time. And there are two, a couple of sub elements of that. The first is if there is evaluation be done, you have to quarantine the resources. And the worst is that you most probably pull in some of your brightest people to do the evaluation, and they're the same people who can contribute elsewhere in the organization. Uh, but that has to be managed. Secondly, that if you're doing evaluation, knowing the pressures of the short term, how can you find make timely findings without jeopardizing your big evaluation project and your those balanced judgments you often only make right at the end by giving feedback as the process goes through. Investing in data is a fairly important step to achieving some of this, because if you've already got good data that can be drawn upon, it does cut down the amount of time evaluation takes. But it leaves all of you with that real challenge of building learning and reflective organizations, acknowledging those pressures of the short term. Sorry, just. Oh, sorry, what's happened is the text uh, uh, comments have just come up onto my screen, but the <clears throat> fourth one is the question of centralization and decentralization. I've already mentioned one part of that, which was to do with the uh, evaluator general, but more broadly, to my mind, it is a perpetual challenge. Uh, and it's not just in the field of evaluation, but it's the classic challenge in policy and program separation and that concept of praxis of having the theory and the practice together. It's most probably one which at times we stew too much over because I think it's unlike, fairly unlikely that there's actually a proper outcome. Rather, I think what we tend to do is we swing one way in an organization and then swing back the other way. Uh, because there are always benefits in having them together, benefits in having them apart. And we just have to accept this transition from one to the other. But the real challenge is that of leadership. Because with good leadership, you can operate under both of those circumstances. Good leadership can force when you've got the, the, to the function centralized can force people to think outwardly. At the same time, when they're decentralized, good leadership helps build the bridges. So the leadership is really critical there. Our preferred approach was one which really, I think, so reflected upon that balance. A unit and central agency and that was to give leadership across the public services and overall to provide oversight and to ensure a fairly comprehensive approach. So it wouldn't be doing all of the work, but it would have this constant role and the constant focus on leadership and comprehensive across government departments. And also that having a centralized function in the central agency really can be used to build enhanced capacity and also enhance some sort of mobility because there's a lot to be said 
for having experienced evaluators moving across functions. Within departments, we'd argue for centralization. Very much to give critical mass because no single evaluator has all of the range of skills you need to conduct a good evaluation. Uh, you need people who do think in both quantitative and qualitative senses. You need people who are very good at working with people, people who are very good working with data. And for all of these things, you actually want a critical mass of people. And but still keeping that mass close to the programs, which we consider one achieves within departments. So they were the sort of key points from Thody. And the final one is big data. And I'll only mention this one briefly because I see times marching on. Uh, big data has many positives. It utilizes existing data, which as I said earlier, is really important because if you've got the data there already, it really helps cut down on that evaluation task. It allows us to look at small population groups, something which we so often don't do, but where we know that because programs have heterogeneous impacts, that we have to be aware of what happens to small groups, as well as the average effects. Gives us lots of covariates and big data derived from program sources gives us a good linkage to program interventions because we know who's been treated. At the same time, it's got negatives. At times, it's limited to program specifics. Uh, and the concepts underlying that. So in social security, the concept of income is very specific. So what's recorded as income is not necessarily the income that you want to use for other purposes. Enormous issues around privacy and social license. And we've seen that with my health record, number of people who weren't willing to do that, and some of the challenges around COVID reporting. And social license is something that has to be built through trust. And unfortunately, <clears throat> in public administration, we've not always taken those actions which build trust, but have rather built mistrust. The other thing that we should never forget about are those at the margin. Because while big data enables us to get to some small population groups, it's just as likely that those who are at the margin of our society are also at the margin of big data. They're the people who will not necessarily use a health service. They're the people who may not necessarily apply for a benefit. And so hence, to simply rely upon big data and thinking of us as being comprehensive will just lead to further neglect of groups who are already neglected in our society. The challenges are for all fairly simple. There has to be a commitment to building, maintaining. We've had in the past some excellent data sets that have just disappeared and have never been maintained. We need good access by those who are needing to use the data but in the end, we most probably, big data still promises more than it will deliver. Matt will most probably disagree with me and tell me that he can deliver a lot with big data. So finally, the lessons, culture is critical and the words leadership and stewardship come through. It really needs to be embedded structurally. So that's through formal units and embedded in processes. It has to cover both evaluation and how we learn from this, which means both as evaluators and as organizations, we have to be reflective and wide looking. We have to invest, of course, in skills and data, but the remaining challenges are there 
And there's a lot of it is to do with the nature of government and public administration in Australia. So thanks. Thank you, um, Rob. That was um, that was just fantastic. And Matt, um, I'll welcome you into the discussion. Um, and perhaps I'll give you the first opportunity to correct anything that you think Rob said that was incorrect um, or anything that he might have missed. No, no, I'd agree with everything Rob said. And, um, you know, I, I think that um, the emphasis on the challenges of accountability um, and the commitment that's required is really the fundamental issue. Yeah. Um, look, there's been some great discussion in the chat. Rob, you probably haven't had a chance to see it, but it's really good. It certainly looks like you have um, sparked um, some, some thinking there, um, and it's, it's really good to see that coming through. Um, one of the questions that I wanted to kick off with um, was just in terms of how, how things have changed. So in particularly from the ANZOG um, research that you did that was two years ago now, um, you know, you, we, we brought in the big data at the end, but is there anything else that you think if you were to do similar research now um, that would feed into a, a similar review? Is there anything else that you would would add to or something that you would change compared to what you did in 2019? I'll let you go, Matt. Yeah, I mean, at, at one level, the um, response from the Commonwealth Government is enlightening, which is partial acceptance of the recommendations which they um, um, uh, suit them. And I mean, I was very heartened to hear the, your discussion about the Northern Territory and uh, it was useful for, for, your, for your work. So I think that um, I, I don't, from my point of view, I wouldn't really, I haven't changed my view about what needs to happen. Um, yeah, I think there's the interesting question over to what extent it would be, it should be internal to government versus a role for an evaluator general. And we, I think, um, came down just on the side of, um, more um, essential function within government structures because we felt that that would embed the learning um, and the cultural change um, more firmly within government uh, and mm -hmm. hopefully lead to a greater um, culture of learning. The question is whether that's actually going to happen. And if it doesn't, then maybe something like an evaluator general becomes a more attractive uh, proposition. Mm. Well, actually, on that. I, I have um, just a quick question um, around the APS um, evaluation profession. What are your thoughts on that, um, having these, uh, this professional stream, and how important is it also to have um, basic evaluation skills within all policy and program offices? Right. Uh, <clears throat> look, I think... The, the trouble in public service is that specialists do not necessarily always move through organisations well. And mm -hmm. that's one slight danger with having an evaluation profession is that they get sidetracked into only doing evaluation. Uh, while there is an awful lot you have to learn about how to do an evaluation, equally, the skills you need as an evaluator are very frequently those skills that you need as a program or a policy developer, as a program analyst. And so hence, I don't necessarily see a division between evaluation skills and that broader set of skills to that degree. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's to do with mindset. Uh, in, the, in those other areas, you're so often focused on seeking the answers. In evaluation, you're almost a fraction more reflective in that you're both seeking answers on what has actually occurred, but you're also answering a lot more at the question about why it has occurred. And so hence, there is sort of a dual function that you have to do within evaluation. Mm -hmm. 
Matt, what are your thoughts? Um, I, I think, yeah, I agree with uh, what Rob said. I think that um, whether evaluation is being done within government or your or it's being contracted out, mm -hmm. I think that um, to get the real value from that, the people involved in the uh, outsourcing of the evaluation and contracting out need to understand something about evaluation and the technical mm -hmm. side of it and how to interpret it. Um, and so that is one of the real challenges is how you can get the, the benefit from um, that, that, that external um, outsourcing evaluation. And people will sometimes say that, you know, to be independent, it needs to be outsourced. And um, in my experience, you can have fiercely independent and high quality evaluation done from within government or outsourced, and you can get evaluation that's designed to produce a certain outcome, whether it done be within government or outsourced. Um, and even with universities where the academics might um, claim that they're not affected by the commercial incentives, um, they are, I mean, many research centres require evaluate, uh, require the money to, 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 to fund staff and so on, and so there are those sort of pressures that can be brought to bear. But also, if you choose the right person, there are certain people who've got known views about certain topics, and if you go to them, you're likely to get an answer that um, you can reasonably predict before you enter them. So I think there's that interesting question about, um, you know, the ability to effectively manage and to ensure that you get high quality evaluation and that you're able to use the findings and learn from the experience. I think that last one is a great point. Um, and although I'm very biased, I think, um, you know, evaluation skills make us better public servants, even a basic understanding of, of data analysis and statistics and being able to read an evaluation report and see its flaws. Um, I think is is a skill that's useful, but obviously I would say that. Um, so more broadly, um, you know, as public servants, there are some things that we can change and some things that we can't change. Um, what are your thoughts in terms of for, for people who would like to um, change the way that evaluation is perceived within the public sector, what are some of the things that you would say individual public servants can, can do? Um, and I know, Rob, in particular, you've been in the public service before and you know how tricky it can be. What are some of the things that individuals can do? Right. Well, I, I think having an understanding of evaluation in the first instance is important for that. Uh, so if you think about in terms of how programs are set up, what are the objectives? Now, what's actually stated in those objectives suddenly becomes really important when you're into evaluation. Mm -hmm. So when people start thinking about how to express a program, think about expressing outcomes in terms of what's actually truly able to be evaluated and also, that's really good because it often gets around some of the very mushy thinking. You know, uh, you have programs designed these days to make the world better. Uh, and, you, okay. and you need to get in there and say, okay, then well, which betterness are you after? So that's one set of contributions. Another one, and it goes back to that point about thinking widely and about corporate knowledge. I think evaluators do have a role in terms of corporate knowledge. And one important function is keeping on building that knowledge back into the organizations. Uh, to give an example, government departments do do a range of papers, a range of submissions to inquiries and things like that. So often these only focus on the immediate. Providing some context, some background, a little chapter on the history of where things have come from, what lessons have been learned in the past, what was successful, what failed, drawing upon those evaluations, and giving context is the sort of little work that you can do and fit into other processes. 
because it's not the sort of thing that people who are immediately at the cut and the thrust of policy will think about. They'll think about writing all of those, that just from now. And to the extent that you can get people reflecting back into that mm -hmm. and giving them sort of the hooks because you've got control of the evaluation material, you've been able to draw upon that. That's a good way of bringing them in. Matt, anything to add? I think sometimes a lot depends upon the views of the very senior people in the department. And I think that there are circumstances within which there are senior people who are not open to evidence and data, in which case I think it's extremely difficult. But if there are senior people who are open to, um, um, to, 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 the, to the potential value and um, um, can see them and, and, and are not overly concerned about the potential risk that they see, then, yeah, then I think individuals can make a very big difference. So I think in part it depends upon um, the environment within which um, people are working. And it's, it's important to be realistic about that. There are times when um, you can fight the good fight, but you're actually on a hiding to nothing. Like it, you know, the chances of bringing about the change are, are, are slim. But, but I do think that when people persist over the longer term, it can actually um, really change things. And you do see that um, in government departments and agencies. Yeah. But it's not so, always comfortable what to be, I would say. Uh, yes, exactly. Um, Joe, I'd be very grateful if you could have a look through the chat to see if there's some questions that we urgently need to address. Um, and while you do that, I, I just wanted to ask one more question. Um, when we talk about things that are uncomfortable, one thing that is uncomfortable is evaluating an existing program, um, especially if it hasn't been designed for evaluation, that can be an uncomfortable process going through the program logic, etc. Um, what are your thoughts on this? You, you did mention it in your paper around, you know, the importance of evaluating existing programs, especially given that a high proportion of government funding is ongoing. Have you seen perhaps examples from other jurisdictions on the best way to approach this challenge? How do we gradually pull in um, and evaluate our high risk existing programs? Right. Do you want to go, Matt, first? Uh, yeah, look, I, I think that there are some things that can be done to, to support longer-term evaluation. Um, but they... So in, for some programs, it's very difficult because decisions weren't made 10, 15, 20 years ago to help establish the evidence base. So... Um, so I think in part, in the paper we talk about this, some of this is about investments in long-term data assets. And one thing Rob referred to in the either presentation or an answer was that there are major valuable data assets that are there and then they're not, and they're, they're not maintained. So I think that, you know, and I note in the chat there's been some questions about ethics and comments about question of ethics and consent, which are very important. So obtaining the necessary ethics consent, the ethics necessary consent from people to um, to uh, to recontact them or to link their data and so on is important. Uh, I think that I do, and this is where I would slightly diverge from Rob, is that I would be I'm more optimistic about the value of linked large scale data to help in this. Um, I think that that potential has not been realised yet. Fully, but it's starting to be. Um, but on a similar vein to Ron's point about those on the margins, these types of data sets only include people generally who are currently receiving a program or a part of a program. Or, and so if, if you're talking about a major change which might dramatically expand the, you know, the scope of coverage of a policy or program, you might well find that the administrative data doesn't tell you much because the mm -hmm. people you're interested in are not in it. Um, so I think that those investments in data assets, um, an investment in long-term research capability and interest on a topic and expertise can really help. But yeah, there are a few things wrong. Yeah, I look, I don't think we've seen that much 
a really good experience that can be drawn yeah. on. Uh, there are some cases where you can say some of the orders of generals work almost touches on that sort of longer term. But I think the essential elements are A, actually identifying what those programs do. And so the data side is enormously important. So before you almost want to answer the question of how, you know, do we evaluate the program? We actually have to start answering the question, what's that program actually do? How big is it? How many people are impacted upon, et cetera? So because we almost stop thinking about some of these embedded programs as actually being a program. So that straight program reporting. And so hence the, that step back from evaluation, the KPIs and the other program measures, embedding that is a really good first step. The second step is, I think as a culture develops, where evaluation is seen as the norm for these new programs, that eventually starts building up some pressure for looking at the old programs. Yeah. But it's long term. I mean, these are programs that may have been in place for 50 odd years. Uh, you don't expect to sort of crank up and get them booked as in the next two years. And uh, have... if, if there are things such as tax expenditures, uh, they're not even recognised as programmes. Uh, with apologies to the few people in taxation who are actually trying to get them identified as programmes. <laughs> oh, gosh. You and Rob, you and, and Matt have given me um, so much to, to think about in some ways. Um, I'm fairly pretty wrapped about where the apps and steering committee has been has been going because many of the things that you're talking about are also things that we um, are working really hard behind the scenes to, to try and do being able to connect people more broadly so that we can uh, look more widely um, being able to have this better capability within the public sector uh, evaluation uh, colleagues um, is certainly a piece for me about how do we get governance right? Um, because with, with good governance and, and kind of getting good sign off and objectives early for program areas, you know, I think it, that gives us a bit of a, a pathway um, going forward. But I, I think I could sit here for several more hours um, and just continue this conversation. Um, but that is not what the AES had in, um, in mind for us. So for those of you who have put um, really thoughtful, insightful questions in the chat that we didn't get to, uh, Christabel and I um, might work with Rob and Matt in the background to see if we might be able to um, bring you back for a, for a sort of a second, a second bite at some of those more complex um, questions. Um, but please, would everybody uh, join me in thanking so much um, Rob and Matt for their wonderful contribution to uh, to the to festival, but also for their fantastic contribution through their careers to, to evaluation in the public sector. It's such a privilege to hear from you. And thank you, Christabel, for your um, your fantastic facilitation. So um, with me, uh, I think we say muted, but we uh, but we clap you. <laughs> Thank you, Rob and Matthew. Really appreciate your time today. Thanks for having us. Brilliant. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye.